don't think there's anything. So let's turn in our Bibles to 1 John chapter 1, title of our study today, Fellowship and Joy. We read here in verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You should know that creation testifies everywhere at all times to everyone. It testifies that God is. It literally says, I am. And all you have to do is look out at the stars or look out at the beautiful ocean or the wonderful mountains or or a beautiful lake. And you got to know God made all that stuff. You want to know what we make? Just go to a big city and you say, this is man's, you know, testimony to man. Lots of cement, lots of tall buildings, very little outward space or outdoor space. But anyway, everywhere God's creation testifies, people are guilty for not crying out and say, who are you? And this, is, this addresses an issue many have, and they're like, well, what about the people that never heard of Jesus? Don't worry about that. Worry about, if you're really concerned, lots of mission trips will be coming up. Get on one of them and go tell one of those people, wherever they might be, about Jesus. Better yet, start at home here in our Jerusalem and go to the university or go to Butte College. Used to be able to go to the high schools. I met Mike Gunther and and, uh, many others there. Uh, Anyway, we used to do a Bible study on the campus. All they had to do was say, hey, we, we want to host the Bible study. And in those days, you could just go. And it was real convenient because we met at the Veterans Hall right across from Chico High for 17 years. But anyway, the creation testifies, God's creation. The word of God clarifies. It helps us see things more clearly. You can know God powerful. You can know he's creative. You can know there is no one like him just by looking at what he made, but you can't know he's holy and loving and merciful and kind. You can't know that without the word of God. And then the word made flesh, our Lord Jesus magnifies as he reveals the father's heart, the father's mind, the father's desires, the father's thoughts. He said, all these things I do, I do them. Because this is what the Father's given me. I do always the things that please the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, some things on John and how he writes and why he writes the way he writes in the way of introduction. John, like Luke, is a very prolific writer. He's responsible for a gospel for 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John as well as the book of Revelation. But John's writings, unlike Matthew, Mark, and Luke, well, they're primarily topical, far less concerned with the order in which things are recorded. 
than the relationship of those things to one another. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about when we see the five reasons John says he wrote this gospel. I mean, this, this, uh, this epistle. I'll give you seven that he, why he um, you know, wrote and what he claimed in the gospel in just a moment. Well, in any case, the exception to that general rule with John is that the order of events and revelation are essential to our understanding of it. So he uses a word that's actually recorded 27 times in scripture, but he uses it eight times in the book of Revelation. And, and the word, well, it's two words, metatauda. In English, that means after these things. So he says, these things went down and after these things, this began to happen. And after these things, then this happened. So you can see how he lays it out. He has the ability to do things chronologically. That just isn't his personal style normally or naturally. What he does here, though, is he weaves a tapestry of word pictures, revealing the wonder and the beauty of God's love and plan for man. In his gospel, John shared seven I am's and seven signs to reveal and confirm who Jesus was, is, and will always be. The first, I am the bread of life. He who eats of me, Jesus says in John 6, will live forever. I am the light of the world, Jesus says. And he says, he who follows after me will not walk in darkness. I am the door, the only way into God's sheepfold. And then because he gives us access, he says in the fourth, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It's been a long time since the Lord first spoke this to my heart. And I was reading through and, and you know, that same passage mentions the hireling. And I wanted to make sure I would never be that. I would never be guilty of doing what I'm doing now for 40 years here for any reason except God called me here and he's blessing me here and his word goes forth and I'm still able to share it with clarity and simplicity and practicality. So, so all of that to say, when he calls himself the good shepherd, he, he makes it clear that that the difference between Jesus and someone committed to Jesus, rightly representing Jesus, is he says the hireling flees when the wolf comes. And so I understood that passage and I made one of the only promises I ever made to God because I learned early on, don't make promises you can't keep. But I know there are promises I can keep because he makes them possible. And this was it. I, Lord, I don't ever want to leave under stress or duress. I will never leave under stress or duress. Why? Because that's how you make bad decisions. It's true in your marriages if you're married. It's true with your kids if you have them. It's true with your friends. You don't make important life-changing decisions when you're stressed or under duress. So here's how that's played out for over 40 years. There's, you never feel like leaving when everything's great. So whenever things get really tough and I'm like, man, I got to get out of here. I can't take this anymore. Although I never sound like that. Well, don't ask Pam. But, but when that time comes, I'm always reminded that never under stress, never under duress. Why? I'm not a hireling. He didn't hire me to come here. My goodness, I made $450 a week playing at Disneyland, doing six shows a day, just having fun, doing what I was just doing here, except this is better material. And uh, except for a few songs we slipped in that were Christian songs. For three years, I was there. Tomorrow on Terrace, coming up, doing a show, going back down. And I went from making $150 a week in the nightclubs, because you know that's what Pam wants me to call them, in the bars, the biker bars. I've shared it all with you. But anyway, I went from making 150 to making 450 a week. So when I had a chance to go to Yuba City and intern, they said, we're only going to be able to pay you a couple hundred dollars a week. I'm like, I don't care. 
I don't, don't pay me anything. Just give me somewhere to live and feed me. And, and I, but, but like, what about your wife and two sons? And I'm like, okay, yeah, we'll need some money. So anyway, we went there. They only paid us a couple hundred dollars. And, and then it, it got up pretty fast. It went up to a few hundred dollars. And they, they ended up paying around $1,000 a month or 15, whatever it was back then. It was, the money went further because we were printing less. And I don't mean me and my friends. I'm talking about our government. And, and so all of that to say this, that, that when we came up here, they literally said we can only pay you 500 a month. And I'm like, hey, I made 450. I was making 1,000 or a little more than that down in Yuba City. Well, I could sure see what living on 500 will, will be like. And, and that we literally came here, a family of four, and, and a church of, they said, 25 people. The second week we were here, only eight people came. Now, there were more the first week, and I thought, wow, so that is amazing. Negative church growth right away. <laughs> How did you know? How do you do it? Well, anyway, all that to say this, that, that the church grew, and we went from five. As soon as there was more money, they gave me $1,000 a month. Still not a living wage even then, although I know some of you, are. that's all you're making now. And things cost a little bit more. But that's all 40 years ago. How does it even matter now? It's because it plays into the fact that if you're doing what God calls you to do to please him and to bless people, then you don't have to worry about anything. My pastor taught us God, where God guides, God provides. So all we had to do is say, Lord, if you're leading us there, well, show us. And, and there are so many stories related to us even getting to Yuba City and then getting from Yuba City to here. But 40 years here, and, and it's just been everything God said it would be and more. Well, anyway, where am I in this introduction? How did I even get down that little rabbit trail? Does anybody know? Well, anyway, I, I told you Jesus did many other signs. Did I say that? Walked on the water? No, I haven't even got there. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I know where I am. I am the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection, and the life. It was the good shepherd. Ding. Okay. He says the fifth I am statement. I am the resurrection and the life. The sixth, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And that addresses the issue of, well, what about all the Buddhists? Or what about all the Muslims? Or what about all these people or those people? They're just as sincere. They're, they're just as religious. That may all be true. But if your faith is in someone who's deceived themselves, you can't hope that they're going to get you to the truth. Or you're going to walk in the truth because they don't even know it. And they're the ones leading you. So, so important that we process that. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to heaven because that's where the Father is. If he could be in one place, you know, he can say he's wherever he wants to be. He could be everywhere at once. He's the only one. He can be throughout time all at once. Not like us having to wait to see how things play out. Well, he also says... I am the true vine. And he talks about, you know, I'm the vine and, and, and you know, I'm, and you're the branches. You're connected to me. Stay connected. Because apart from me, he says, you can do nothing, no thing. Well, not just seven I am's. He gives us seven signs still in his gospel. And this is just in the way of getting familiar with John. If you already know these things, well, you can see how, ordered they are, how his brain thinks and how his heart works. And so in the, the seven signs, each of them point to some reality that's going to get fleshed out more as we go here and through 1 John. First sign, water to wine. Second sign, the nobleman's son. Third sign, the man at the pool of Bethesda. It could be a song, could it not? Yeah. To that man, he said, do you want to be made whole? And I believe he'll be saying that to some today. Those of you gathered here, hopefully or potentially, those who are logged on or listening in or in the overflow or in the cafe or wherever they might be across the street working out, 
I think it's Planet Fitness over there. So many people have said, we watch you every Sunday. And I'm like, I've never seen you before. And they go, well, we watch you at Planet Fitness. I'm going, well, they're broadcasting me there? No, we watch you on our phone while we work out on our machines. But anyway, I'm like, well, welcome to the family. Happy to have you. Because do I care? I just want them to hear the word and be transformed by the word. I want them to become more like Jesus. And if they don't know him, to get to know him. So those other things can happen. So he turns water to wine. The second time, the nobleman's son is healed. The third, the man at the pool of Bethesda and his question to them, again, him, do you want to be made whole? He didn't ask him if he wanted to be healed. I think in the movies sometimes they say that because we understand it better. To be healed would be a physical reality, an impossible thing, and it would demonstrate God's, well, power. But to be made whole, that's a spiritual reality. It's more than fixing a physical problem. It's spiritual. It's a dynamic that without Jesus, without the Father, without the Holy Spirit, that dynamic wouldn't even exist. So he asked, do you want to be made whole? And he says the same thing. So many of us have said, if somebody says, well, do you want to fix that, your marriage? Do you want to deal with this thing with your kids? Do you want help talking to this person? And, or do you just want to get right with the Lord? And they'll be like, well, I can't do any of that. Why? People have so many excuses. You might be one of those people. If you have excuses for why you're stuck where you are, listen to Jesus. Do you want to be made whole? Do you want me to fix the whole thing? Not just take care of this little issue, your finances or your, your housing or your whatever it might be, this relationship or that. Just do you want to be whole? Because if you're whole, all the rest of those things will come well, they'll come around. Fourth, fourth thing he claimed to be, uh, after, or the, the fourth thing of the seven that, that um, he actually did was he fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a couple fish. Then he walked on the water. That's the fifth. The sixth, the man born blind. Seventh, Lazarus raised from the dead. And John, and we're almost done there, and we'll be right into 1 John in just a moment, I promise. In, in John's gospel, he concludes it, and he'll do the same thing in, in this letter, in the, in the last chapter. But in John 20, verse 30, Jesus says this, truly, well, John writes this. Jesus truly did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So John begins here and all of this will make sense all of a sudden. He starts by sharing five reasons why he wrote. They're not all in the first chapter, but if you read the book and it's only five chapters, it's a short and easy read. I read it over and over and over before prepping for this first chapter and thinking about all I know about his earlier writings and what he says here, because I want this to be fresh for me. I wanted him to speak to me because I'm in some strange situations and in an odd season of life. Did you know as you get old, you've never been there before? Every day I get up and I'm like, what is that? There's new pains. There's new things. I still have all my parts, but they're just not working right. So anyway, in 1 John, he gives us five reasons why he wrote 1 John. The first and the second are here in chapter 1, where we read uh, verse one, chapter 1, verse 3, that which we've seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. In verse 4, he says, these things we write to you that your joy may be full. And when we get and start taking apart each verse, because it's a very short letter, well, we'll see the connection between fellowship and joy. And some of you will already have made it, that you're already connecting the dots. 
And then the third is in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. Why? It's easy. Sin separates us from him. You will lose your joy and you'll break fellowship. But we'll get there when we get there. Chapter 226, the fourth, these things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Now, that's not as clear as the others. So knowing that to be forewarned is to be forearmed, he's saying, really, I've written these things to you so you won't be deceived. And then in chapter 5, verse 13, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. This is very much like his closing for, for John's gospel. And, and he says, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. There are six others. We'll look at them when we get to them. I think they're all in chapter two. They speak to little children, to fathers and young men. That's three of the six. Then he goes back to the little children and does the fathers and the young men. And you should read the whole book. I always recommend that. We're in Joshua on Wednesday night. I encourage you to come. And, and we're, we did an overview. Then we did the first two chapters. And, and I encourage everyone to read the whole book before you come. If you read the whole book, you'll still come. But I want to say, if you don't read this whole book, you're cheating yourself because there's so much that I'm not going to say in spite of all I am going to say. There's so many things God can speak to your heart as you just pray and read the word and say, Lord, open up my heart, open up my mind. Show me what you have for me here in this chapter and in these things. So verse 1 we start where we started a while ago. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. He begins here by citing three of our five senses and describing their relationship to Jesus. Why? He wants us to know that they literally heard him, saw him, and touched him. And that's the, the, the senses, right? Hearing, seeing, and touching. There are two others. They never said, yeah, we tasted and smelled him too. Uh, that might be disrespectful, but I brought it up anyway. But uh, the, these are used elsewhere. They're cited elsewhere. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. While the Old Testament sacrifices that pointed to his, his sacrifice are called a sweet aroma, a sweet smell unto our Lord. 36 times in Exodus, Leviticus, and numbers. Taste Psalm 119, 103. Listen, how sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. John 8, 52, then the Jews said to him, now we know you have a demon. Abraham's dead, the prophets are dead, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never taste death. He doesn't mean we won't die physically. He means we will be alive forever spiritually. Hebrews 2.9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Well, here in verse 2, see already there, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness. That word to bear witness is to testify. He uses it once in Matthew. Well, Matthew uses it once. Um, it's, it's, and Luke uses it once. Uh, 33 times John uses it in his gospel. 10 times in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. 4 times in the book of Revelation. We bear witness, we testify, we share the truth that we know and declare. That means to announce, to herald, to publish verbally in their day and ultimately not just verbally because it all gets written down and we're able to read it now. 
That's something, by the way, they couldn't do in their own day. Even the Old Testament, which was the only Bible they had and had been translated into Greek, which everyone could read, they didn't have access to it. They didn't have one or two or three or four or five ways to read the scripture. We're in that part of, of Joshua where from this point on, they will regularly read the entire five books of Moses at, at the Feast of Tabernacles. And when they, they get into the land, one of the first things they're going to do is read all the scripture they had. Because those first five books, that's all the scripture they had then. But in Jesus' day, they had the entire 39 books of the Old Testament. And that's what they read. When, and they have, whenever they say the word of God or the, the testimony of God, they're referring to the Old Testament because these things are being lived out and then recorded for us, not for them. They were living it. Verse 2 I'm shared the life was manifested. We've seen and bear witness and declare. That means to announce to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. You know the story. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. But before it says that in John 1.14 and John 1.1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And that, that, that the sense of all that in, in the original is that he was face to face with the Father. They were looking into one another's eyes. And this is, of course, pre-incarnate. It's before the virgin birth of Jesus, but he existed. And by the way, he existed in the same form as the Father. And that form was spirit. So the Father was spirit, Jesus was spirit, and the Holy Spirit was spirit. But Jesus is the only one who ever took on flesh, who became one of us, that he might save us from ourselves and from our sins. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. Again, I shared it. The word was with God and the word was God. 1, 14, I'm just putting them in right order now because I didn't turn the page. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John here in verses three and four continues, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. I mentioned some of you will have already connected the dots, but I'll connect them for those of you who haven't. In his presence, fullness of joy. So if we're having fellowship with him, our joy will be full. And I've shared it many times. God never fills our cup just enough. He never gives us just enough. He always gives us all we need and then some to spill over into the lives of those around us. And certainly this is bearing witness to that reality and his presence, fullness of joy. Now, John, having revealed who Jesus is and what that means and his desire that we have fellowship with them and with the Father and with the Son, he begins to contrast life in him or apart from him. And he'll do it by talking about the light and the darkness, the truth and the lies. And then we'll be reminded everyone has a choice. So everyone must decide to walk in darkness, self-deception and death. Well, no one has to decide to do that. That's what we do naturally. Jesus never ever said to, to pray or to, to just do whatever comes natural. Why? Whatever comes natural is not going to be spiritual. The natural man doesn't even know the things of the spirit. It means he can't understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So all of that to say that, that he is telling us there's this life and there's that life and you get to choose. And by the way, everyone does make a choice. The one who says, well, I just can't choose. Too hard to make the decision. Really? If it was just heaven and hell, you would think it would be easy. Turns out, while most people who believe in God, and that's most people on planet Earth, 
They don't all believe in the same God. They don't believe, all believe in the true and living God, but most of them believe there is a God, and most of those believe in heaven. And when you ask them how you're going to get there, that's when there's a breakdown. But the, here's the problem is, is that if we believe in God and we believe in heaven, even among those who say, I believe in God and I know which one it is. I know that Jesus is the son of God and God, the son, the savior of the world. They can get all that right and then say, and I believe in heaven, but I can't believe in hell. The problem with that is Jesus spoke more of hell than he did heaven. He talked about heaven. I don't like talking about hell, but he did it because he wanted everybody to know. The choice isn't just heaven and hell, but those destinations are going to be the result of your choice in another area. And the question is, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be holy? Do you want to leave a lead a pure life you want to be transformed and become more like Jesus because if that doesn't sound like something you want you would hate heaven because everybody there's holy and everybody there's worshiping Jesus we will be crowned and that's a big deal here right you get a crown well people don't really get a crown anymore they get a trophy or they get something they get a wreath and again it's the Olympics year so we get to see all that happen later but, but in heaven, we're going to be crowned, and there are multiple possibilities, but we're going to fall on our faces and cast our crowns at his feet and sing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So when someone says, well, look, I, I, yeah, if there's heaven and hell, then I want heaven. And then when they find out you need to be holy to go there, they're like, how would I ever be holy to do you know who I am, what I am? And, and, and yeah, yeah, you can be holy. God can make you holy. But somebody wants nothing to do with holiness, then they want nothing to do with God because our God is a holy God. So anyway, all that brings us to verse five. This is the message which we've heard from him and declare to you that God is light. You know, the first thing, when he's creating, you know, the heavens and the earth, he says, and let there be light. He manifested what he is inherently. And then the same thing's true when he shows his love to us. It's because he is inherently loving. He is inherently holy. He is inherently so many things that, well, they don't come naturally. None of us are inherently those things. Those are imparted to us or imputed to us when we put our faith in the one who died for our sins, was buried and rose again. When we say, Jesus, be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me for buying the lie, for promoting the lie that we can live however we want and do whatever we want, and somehow things will work out fine. They don't, and they won't. So he says, God's light and there is no darkness at all. There are so many people who get their theology from culture, from movies, from series, from whatever, sports writers, whatever you're into, they have a personal view of these things and they'll often share them. And, and we saw it in things like Star Wars. Now I know Star Wars is dated, but I'm pretty sure most of you, even the youngest among you have seen it. And when my older son was very young, we watched Star Wars. So that was a while ago, since he's 47 now. But, but when he was, he was just a little guy, and we watched it, and, and, and you know, Darth Vader's there, and I'm your father, and all that stuff. And, and, and he looks and says, Darth Vader's a little bit nice. And I'm like, no, he's pure evil. There's no goodness, there's no light, there's no love, he's evil. But he just wanted to think everybody was a little nice, even Darth Vader. So God is just saying, it's not like he's light and dark. That's what they were trying to sell, right? That you can be light and dark. No, you're light or dark. You can't walk in the light and in darkness. You can't walk in truth and in lies, in truth and deception. You, you can't walk with God and walk according to the ways of the world. So he's pure light and there is no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him, and remember, this is one of the reasons he wrote, so we could have fellowship 
with him. If we say, and that's a, a repeated phrase, I'll try to emphasize it so you see it. And uh, I go through and I look for anything that repeats over and over and over. So it's here in verse six, it's here in verse eight, it's here in verse 10. And I just underlined it so it stands out to me. But, but anyway, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Nobody likes being called a liar. Well, anybody like being called a liar? I didn't think so. I never liked it. And, and for some reason, in, in my Disneyland band, which was all Christians, for some reason, every now and then, I'd be talking to the drummer, and he was just fond of saying, you lie. And I'm like, what? You know I don't lie. But for some reason, he thought that was hilarious. Me, not so much. So anyway, if we say we have fellowship with him and darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth and that word practice is going to be important in this this letter and throughout the scriptures because just as doctors practice medicine sinners practice sin lovers practice love christians practice living like Christ. It, it's speaking more of, of a single act. It's talking about a lifestyle of going this direction or that, walking in darkness or walking in light, walking in death or walking in life, walking in, in lies or walking in truth. Well, anyway, fellowship with him. It's one of those reasons he wrote. So if we say we have fellowship with him, we walk in darkness, we lie and don't practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, he has fellow, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So let me ask, are you walking in the light? Is your life filled with all that God's planned for you? Or is the enemy messing with you? He's got a hold of you, whispering in your ear. I thought early on, before I really understood these things, if I was walking in the light, then I wouldn't sin. Because, I mean, it, it's like, you know, he says those who are drunk are drunk at night. Not anymore. They're drunk all day. But, but in that day. People waited, and, and, and he says, those who do this, they do it in the darkness. That's when the thieves get out and do their, their worst because it's hard to spot them and to see them. And, and, and so here's what he's saying, and, and I used to think, well, if I'm walking with him in the light, then I'm not going to sin because I know he's right there. I know that the light exposes everything. And, and, and even the things I didn't call sin, but here's what I realized. The, the problem is God sees the heart. He knows our thoughts. He knows what we're going to say before we say it. But he still tells us, if you're going to pray, pray it. Why? He delights in the fellowship. He just wants us to come and say, hey, I'm having a tough time here. He's like, I know. Man, I'm watching. That's got to hurt. So all of that to say this, that, that the light exposes what I didn't even know was sin. When I first came to Christ, having grown up in the church, but only up until 13 years old, and then I, I kind of got away. Well, I went through a little catechism thing, 13 to 16, which was interesting, having grown up in Southern Baptist churches. Stepdad, Tony's dad, crazy story, but not, no time for it. But anyway, after that, I walked away, and I didn't go near a church or talk to Christians, at least that I knew were Christians, for 10 years. I just stayed away from all of it. And one thing I did know, though, well, I knew a lot of things, even in that, even in the Protestant and then the Catholic time, they all taught that there was a God that created us, that loves us, and that Jesus came and suffered and died for us. I heard that everywhere. So it's not true that just because people are mixed up about some things, they can't get anything right. Sometimes they have the most important thing right, but then they have all this other stuff that gets in the way. Not picking on anyway, I'm just saying. But my experience was I kind of hesitated to, to even think about Jesus or the Bible or those things because I knew if I gave my life to the Lord, I was going to have to stop doing a lot of stuff that I really liked and enjoyed, had fun doing, bragged about. Now I'm ashamed of all of those, but there's nothing I can do 
but warn you. If you're doing stuff that you think is fine and then you find out hearing the word or reading the word, it's not fine. It's sin. Then you want to confess it and you want to turn from it. That's what repentance means. Confess means to say what God says about it. That the wages of sin is death. So when we confess that we're sinning, saying you're walking in the darkness, you're walking in death, you're, you're either deceived or you, and if, if all of those are true, you're leading others in the wrong direction. So, so again, he says in, in verse eight, knowing that, that we need to call sin, sin, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Here's the funny part. If you tell people you're not a sinner, and they have any background at all. They're going to say, are you kidding? You're, you're the worst sinner I know. And then you'd be like, well, I know some sinners are worse than me. Really? Wow. So you're comparing yourself to the worst people you know? I should do that with you. Uh, anyway, the point I'm making is simple. That, that if we compare ourselves with the worst of others, well, how, that's, that's just foolish. If you want to know how holy you are and how pure you are and how all the things God wants you to be, how many of those you are naturally, the number is zero. And if you want to know the standard, you don't look at people around you. You look up. You look at Jesus, who did always the things that please the Father, who was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. So I knew I was going to have to give up some stuff. It kind of made me hesitate for a moment. But that was only in the time where I was wandering in the wilderness of sin, where I was justifying things I was doing in my life that in my heart I knew were wrong the whole time. And I knew if I come to Jesus, I'm going to have to give all that stuff up. Here's the good news. There's nothing he takes away that he doesn't give you something a thousand times better to replace it. So if you know people like this or if you are them, uh, there are many I've met who say, well, I, yeah, I've made some mistakes. I'm like, are you, do you know that you're a sinner? And, and they're like, well, I wouldn't call, I don't necessarily call it that. Uh, I've made mistakes. I mess up now and then, but I am a good person. And my response, if that would be you today or somebody logged on or listening in or even tuned in even better. Listen, if you say I'm a good person, I have one question for you. Are you? Because Jesus says, no, you're not a good person. Not inherently. Now, I'm not saying none of you are good people, but if you're good, you better give him all the glory because every good thing in me is Jesus and every good thing in you is Jesus. And so when people say, I'm a good person, and, and it's, listen, the Bible says there are none who do right, no, not one. There are none righteous, no, not one. And righteous means right in the sight of God, not always men because they don't even recognize righteousness. So in any case, many will say, I've messed up or I've made mistakes, but they won't say, Jesus, forgive me my sins. And without saying that, they will die in their sins. You could die in your sins. None of are righteous. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you refuse to call sin, sin, Here's the bad news. There's no fixing that. There's no forgiveness for that. And you're like, why do we got to call it sin? Because he says, if we confess our sins, we're going to read it here in verse 9 in a minute. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So if I call it, well, I guess I messed up a little here. Or I, that was kind of a... Uh, yeah, I didn't really intend it. It doesn't matter what your motivation was. Sin is sin. And even when you do good, motivation then matters. So, so we can deceive ourselves, and many have. That's why he says, I don't want you to be deceived. It was one of the five reasons he says he wrote. If you refuse to call sin, sin this verse 8, that's as far as I can take you. You will never go any further until you call sin what God calls it. 
But if you call sin, sin, and if you do what he says in verse 9, you must do, then you find forgiveness and cleansing from all sin. If we confess, and confess means to say what God says about it. We use the word, or used to, well, we do still use it around here this way. To confess used to be what a criminal did when he got caught. He's caught red-handed, and he's like, okay, you got me. Now, and I do want to say there's an exception in this unique little place called Butte County, you know, some of the surrounding cities and such, because you know in the Bay Area, they have decriminalized crime. So they no longer even have it. The way they dealt with the crime issue is they stopped calling it crime. And they just let people do whatever they want. And then they call them not criminals because there's no such thing as crime over there. And they're starting to get the idea that this might not have been the best plan. I hope they figure it out. Here in Butte County, listen, if you go break the law, then you're a lawbreaker. And the police actually arrest people here and put them in jail. And we have people that are police. We have former chief of police. We have... We have people that are working in the jail, so we can come and visit you there. But the, the bottom line is that the, this whole thing of not calling sin, sin, is totally stupid. And, and I don't usually use the S word because I get in trouble at home for that one. But uh, anyway, if we confess our sins, that's what I'll ask you to do today. <laughs> not out loud, please, but, but just you and the Lord. Because if you can get through all this and say, wow, I wish I had something to confess. Listen, if you really can't think of anything and you're married, ask your spouse. If you have kids, ask them. But be ready for a list. Because they're watching all the time, listening all the time. So he says, if you'll call it what he calls it and you'll ask him to forgive you for it, well, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, latter part of verse 9, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is faithful. He never fails. He never lies. He keeps all his promises, but Satan and his reps are all liars. God is just. Our true and living God is just and merciful. At the cross, mercy and justice meet. And it's the only place both can be satisfied, where both find fellowship. And God keeps all his promises. He's forgiving. His blood shed on the cross made forgiveness not just possible, but right. Right to do. Certain for believers. Possible for all. Cleansing. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us reason together says the Lord, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. They are red like, though they're red like crimson, they will be as wool. For any who'd say today, before we read verse 10 and give you a couple other things to chew on and, and uh, meditate on later. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I don't like that make him a liar because God is, can't lie he won't lie he doesn't lie we'll be clear to say we make him out to be a liar because God says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God the wages of the sin is death the gift of God everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord and so if we say that we have haven't sinned we're not sinners well we're calling God a liar we're making him out to be a liar something he has never been and will never be and he will never do Romans 3 10 says I mentioned it earlier but I wanted to read it to you there is none righteous no not one there is none who understands there are none who seeks after God they have all turned aside they have together become unprofitable there is no one who does good no not one God's heart God's desire, God's offer today, fellowship with him, a joyful life, freedom from sin, freedom from deception. 
and that you may know that you could be sure that you have eternal life and continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Finally, Jeremiah 29, 11. If you're not sure about God and what he thinks of you, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Lord, how grateful I am for John, that you called him, that you discipled him, that you transformed him, and that you used him, Lord. And his gospel has been such a blessing to me for decades now. And first, second, and third John, equally so. And Revelation, Lord, we know we're not far from that book. And there he is, much older and much wiser. And you meet with him and you give him all those things to write and, and to share. And we have them recorded. And I'm so grateful, Lord, for all that we learn just in first John. And I pray that Every person here and everyone who hears this or sees this at any time will not just read chapter one, but at least read chapter one. Having heard these things, process the, what God says to you as a result. And then just to read these five chapters, as I've been doing this week again and again and again and again, not just so I'll have something to preach or teach, but so that God's word can deal with me, with my thoughts, my heart, my ambitions, my desires, my needs, my fears, whatever it is, Lord, you address it in such a clear and practical way through your servant, John. And I pray that if there'd be any or many today who've never said, Jesus, come into my life, I am guilty, I'm ready and willing to confess I'm a guilty sinner in the sight of the God who made me. And I want to know you, and I want to know your forgiveness. I want fellowship with you. That word, by the way, means to have all things in common. How much does an unbeliever have in common with God? Nothing. But a believer, everything in common, everything at your disposal, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights with whom there is no shadow of turning. So if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus and you're convicted that you need to take that step, you need to pray that prayer, you need to make a decision and you need it to be a good decision. Just raise your hand, would you? So I can pray for you and introduce you to the God who saved me from myself and saved me from my sin, from my stupidity, from thinking I could be okay in this life or in the life to come. And all that was a lie. And so if you've never given your life to him right now, right here, I want to pray with you, pray for you. I want you to leave here no longer dead in trespasses of sin, but alive forever in him. Anyone this hour, anyone this service, anyone logged on listening in, in the cafe, in the overflow, Planet Fitness, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you need to stop right now and pray, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me. I'm guilty. You're holy. Change me, save me, transform me, and use me. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We have a short clip. I told you it's only a minute, but it, well, it's an awesome clip. So anyway, watch it, and then the worship team will come up and lead us in a rousing hymn.